So we're going to talk about the approach to the comatose patient, and we're going to focus on identifying reversible causes since these are obviously the most amenable to treatment. Uh, in terms of the pathophysiology of coma, as many of you are aware, and I should mention, this is mostly uh, for clinicians. However, hopefully patients will also, also find it interesting. In terms of the pathophysiology of coma, there's areas of the brainstem, the ascending reticular activating system, which communicate with the relay station, which is the thalamus, which then sends signals to all sorts of parts of the cortex and cerebellum. That's the anatomic basis. The, the physiologic basis of coma has to do with either diffuse neuronal dysfunction, you know, for example, a patient with a low blood sugar or a patient with a really high sodium, uh, or structural brain disease, a patient with a brain tumor uh, or an intracranial hemorrhage. And there's a few mimics that we won't discuss in this brief lecture, uh, mimics such as psychogenic unresponsiveness and locked-in syndrome and, and akinetic mutism. This is the algorithm that I use, and we'll work our way through it. it. It looks kind of busy right now, but we're going to deconstruct it and think first about just the initial stabilization. As an emergency physician, you know, this is the first thing I think about the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, uh, and I add G in there, the blood glucose, because that should be something that any patient with an altered mental status should have every single time. Airway protection, if the patient needs it, uh, one would intubate the patient to control their airway and be able to maintain ventilation and oxygenation. Uh, sometimes one will need to intubate simply to get imaging studies in a comatose patient. Uh, IV access will obviously be important both for medications and fluids and optimization of the CPP, the cerebral perfusion pressure. And obviously, if the patient does have hypoglycemia, a low blood sugar will need to treat that. There is the coma cocktail, uh, which is thiamine and dextrose 50% and naloxone. Uh, these are fairly standard, uh, the thiamine being given prior to the glucose uh, to make sure that the patient doesn't have a thiamine deficiency. And in selected cases, one might uh, elect to use flumazenil, which is a benzodiazepine antagonist, and physostigmine uh, in, in very rare instances nowadays. So the history, you know, the history comes to us in the emergency department sort of in, in blasts of information. It's fragmentary, it's incremental. Uh, we might get information from family or witnesses, a shopkeeper, for example. We might get uh, information from EMS, emergency medical services. If we're sure about the patient's identity, uh, we may get information from old hospital records. Uh, the patient may have a medical alert bracelet on their wrist, or they may have a medication list in their wallet. And, and information gets updated. It, it could be every few minutes or every 10 minutes or every hour. Uh, it's important to continue to reassess and reevaluate your differential diagnosis as new information becomes available. Obviously, one of the most important things in any uh, history, but especially in neurological patients, is the timing. Is it abrupt? Is it gradual? And the evolution. Has it been steady over time, or is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Does it wax and wane? Uh, those are important pieces of history to try to get. And then other things such as, is there any evidence for trauma? Is there any evidence for uh, ingestions uh, or accidental uh, over-medication, and what comorbidities, excuse me, what comorbidities the patient has. The physical exam is also helpful. Uh, the vital signs, if a patient has a fever or is hypothermic or is extremely hyper or hypotensive, uh, those might be important clues. Uh, is the patient tachycardic or they bradycardic? Uh, do they have a really fast or really slow respiratory rate? All of the vital signs, obviously, uh, may be diagnostic clues to a specific diagnosis. The general physical exam may show odors, like a patient with uh, uremia, for example, uh, or a tongue laceration if a patient had a seizure. Uh, it might show evidence of head trauma or a goiter if the uh, coma is thyroid-related. There may be cutaneous signs of liver disease. The patient may show needle marks, which would be a sign uh, for an opioid uh, overdose. And they might have a heart murmur, which might suggest some cardiac cause. The neurological exam, uh, there's sort of three basic questions that I pose when I have a comatose patient. You know, is there evidence of structural brain damage? 
Is there evidence of elevated intracranial pressure? And is there evidence of abnormal brainstem function? This is becoming a bit of a, a dying art, but if one were to look in the fundi of a patient uh, with coma, you might see this finding, which is papilledema, which is indicative of elevated intracranial pressure. It, it doesn't develop in minutes or hours, but it takes many hours to days to develop, but it's worth looking for. Uh, this is an example of venous pulsations. You can see if you were looking in with a fundoscope, those venous pulsations correlate fairly well with a normal intracranial pressure. Now, absence of venous pulsations is not as useful, but the presence of venous pulsations suggests that the uh, pressure is normal. Nowadays, the younger emergency physicians are using ultrasound to look at the optic nerve sheath diameter. Uh, like with papilledema, uh, it is a sign of increased intracranial pressure. It doesn't give you an actual number, uh, but it is a kind of quick and dirty way uh, of assessing the presence or absence of elevated intracranial pressure. And by the way, with the ophthalmoscope, you may sometimes see a large hemorrhoid, hemorrhage, uh, a um, subhyaloid hemorrhage, uh, which is often a sign of a subretinoid hemorrhage or some other pathology that rapidly increase the intracranial pressure. Lab testing, there's some tests that every patient needs. For example, a, a complete blood count and a CHEM-7, liver function test, a venous blood gas. And then most patients will need a toxic screen. Some patients will need you know, thyroid testing, adrenal testing, ammonia levels. Uh, ammonia levels, even in a patient with liver disease, by the way, don't correlate very well uh, with whether or not the liver disease is causing encephalopathy or not. So I caution you about that. And then if there's a question of sepsis, blood cultures, and then other tests on a case-by-case -case basis. In terms of a metabolic acidosis, there's a mnemonic that you know, one can use CULT, K-U-L-T, ketones that could be from either diabetic ketoacidosis or alcoholic ketoacidosis, uremia, and these are patients that are untreated, usually very late in their course, uh, lactic acidosis from hypoperfusion or sepsis, some toxins. And, and I, I mentioned Wernicke's uh, again, because this is not just seen in patients with uh, severe alcohol overuse syndrome. Uh, it's also seen in uh, young women, for example, with hyperemesis gravidarum, or patients that have had bariatric surgery and are malabsorbing thiamine. So think about thiamine and uh, give thiamine liberally in patients with a lactic acidosis and altered mental status. And then, of course, there are various toxins like methanol and ethylene glycol, aspirin, and others. So the next question is, you know, does the initial evaluation suggest a structural cause? And we'll talk about some of the details in a moment. Um, but if there's not a likely structural cause, that is, if there's a likely treatable non-structural cause, for example, hypoglycemia or hyponatremia or pneumonia with early sepsis, um, then we treat that. And, and the reality is that not every comatose patient in the emergency department needs a brain CT scan. Uh, we tend to get them in a majority of patients. Uh, certainly, if your practice is in an intensive care unit, you're going to get them in 100% of patients, most likely. But there are three large studies of non-trauma ED coma patients, and only approximately half of them had a CT performed. In the largest study that was done in, in Sweden with nearly 900 patients, uh, only 40% or so had a CT scan. And the physicians using their gestalt had a pretty good record. You know, of the 633 patients that had a metabolic cause, 23% uh, had a CT scan and fewer than 5% were abnormal. Whereas of the 242 patients that had a structural cause, 90% received a CT and 84% uh, of those were abnormal. So, so Gestalt in this study worked fairly well. You know, who doesn't need a CT scan? Well, a diabetic patient with DKA uh, who hasn't been taking their insulin for a few days, they don't necessarily need a DKA. A college student that's brought in by sober uh, compadres that say they've been drinking a lot, there's no history of trauma, uh, there's no history of other medications, they don't necessarily need a CT scan. An older patient with an obvious UTI and a fever and mild hypotension, they don't necessarily need a CT scan in the absence of a fall. And a cirrhotic patient with prior episodes of encephalopathy who stopped taking their lactulose, they don't necessarily need a CT. So again, in, in an uh, all-comer emergency department population, it's not that unusual to not get a CT.
if there if it's likely that there's a non-structural cause, then you treat that presumed cause, and if they're improving, that's great. Uh, if there's no change in or or worsening, then you do uh, get the CT scan. Now, it's important to remember that some patients will have two causes. So an alcohol intoxication patient might also have fallen and have an intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, a patient with hypoglycemia might be hypoglycemic from sepsis. Uh, a patient with psychiatric disease uh, might also have a drug overdose. And a patient with an intracranial hemorrhage might also have hydrocephalus. So remember, you know, the rule of parsimony doesn't always apply. And some patients will have more than one cause. Well, if the diagnosis is not clear in terms of presence or absence of a structural cause, if there's significant doubt, uh, then you get a CT. And if you think it's structural and, and in all patients with head trauma, then the next step is to get a non contrast CT scan. If the CT scan is diagnostic, then you know, you've know you got your path in terms of treatment. Um, and there's a checklist to think about. Is there tissue shift? Is there hydrocephalus? Is there hemorrhage? Are the basal cisterns open? Are there any abnormalities in the thalamus? And is there a hyperdense basilar artery? Here's an example of a patient with tissue shift. You can see that the midline is that yellow dotted arrow, uh, line rather, uh, but the actual midline in this patient is shifted over a couple few centimeters. Uh, is there hydrocephalus? This is a patient that had a corpus callosum tumor and you can see obvious uh, hydrocephalus of the lateral ventricles. Is there any blood? You can see on the on your right, on the patient's left, you don't see the uh, sulci very well. You see them quite well on the patient's right side, but you really don't see them at all. And this is a great example of an isodense subdural hematoma in an older patient that presented about two weeks after the initial trauma. Uh, it's a good idea to sort of follow the inner table. Uh, Bill Copen from Mass General uh, provided me with this slide, but train yourself to go all around the inner table in any non-contrast brain CT. And remember to look at the bone windows also, because you won't always see the fractures unless you look at bone windows. Are the basal cisterns obliterated? <clears throat> Here's a shot at the pons, the level of the pons. There should always be what I call a ring around the brainstem. There should be a black ring of spinal fluid around the brainstem. And if you can't see that, something is causing it, either, either compression or blood or spinal fluid with an exceptionally high protein content. Now, here are two examples. On the left, you can see blood anterior to the pons. This is a patient with a perimesencephalic hemorrhage. Uh, these patients are not usually comatose. They usually do quite well, actually. But you can see how you miss the ring around the brainstem. And then on the right, there's blood in the interpeduncular cistern. Uh, this is at the level of the midbrain. I always remember that because it looks like Mickey Mouse with the ears. And in between the ears is some blood. And if you don't look for that because it's symmetrical, you, you might not see it. So again, it's a checklist. You want to go through this fairly rigidly. Uh, here's just another example of blood uh, to the uh, patient's right, to our left, around the midbrain. Again, you can see Mickey Mouse and you can see some other blood uh, in the uh, Sylvian fissure as well. Same thing here on the patient's left. In this case, uh, always look for a ring around the brainstem. Are there abnormalities of the thalamus? Uh, this is a patient, uh, this is a delayed CT scan that shows what's called an artery of Percheron stroke, where you get strokes uh, bilateral uh, thalami. And the reason for this is that about 10% of patients, five to 10%, will have a single unilateral artery that comes off the first segment of the posterior cerebral, and this is called the artery of Percheron. Most people will have a vessel coming off on both sides so that if you have a small vessel infarct, it'll only knock off one side of the thalamus. But in patients with an artery of Percheron, which is a normal variant of, uh, or variant of normal, uh, who also happens to get a small vessel infarct, they'll knock out the entire thalamus and they can present with instant coma. Is there a hyperdense basilar artery? Uh, just like there can be a hyperdense middle cerebral, there can be a hyperdense any artery in the brain. And this is an example of a hyperdense uh, basilar artery. And that's a sign to look for in a comatose patient suggestive of a basilar artery thrombosis. So if the CT is diagnostic, you're going to consult a specialist. It might be a neurologist. It might be a neurosurgeon. It might be a neurointerventionalist. It might be a neurocritical care person. You're going to begin treating the presumed cause. You'll get further studies as needed. 
uh, and many of these patients <clears throat> will need advanced imaging, uh, an MRI and or a CTA to look for basilar artery occlusion. What about if the CT is not diagnosis, di diagnostic? Then you're going to look for brainstem findings. And these brainstem findings are unequal pupils, uh, especially a unilaterally dilated pupil. Um, it's easier to see if you're looking in, the, in a dark room, uh, ophthalmoplegia or any central pattern of nystagmus, meaning vertical upbeating or downbeating nystagmus true torsional nystagmus or direction changing nystagmus. When they look to the right, the fast component beats to the right. When they look to the left, the past fast component looks to the left. Uh, if they have any vertical malalignment of the eyes called skew deviation, obviously flexor, extensor, posturing, uh, pathologic breathing patterns. Uh, and if the C-spine has been cleared, uh, this is another test that's kind of gone out of favor, but it can be useful, uh, cold caloric testing. So does the patient have brain stem findings? If they do, then we're back in that box where we're action-oriented and consulting specialists, treating presumed cause, and getting further diagnostic studies as indicated. Uh, if it doesn't, if there are no obvious brain stem findings, then there's still a diagnostic checklist. There's five things that I think about, again, that are reversible causes of coma, um, that I wanna think about. Does the patient have a condition requiring advanced imaging? Do they have a poisoning requiring specific treatment? Do they need a lumbar puncture and intravenous antimicrobials? Do they need an emergent EEG? And does the patient need hormone or thiamine replacement? So if the patient has anything suggestive of brainstem findings, or you're just not sure, or there's an abrupt onset, maybe you think it's a artery or Percheron stroke, uh, sometimes uh, inferior division of the middle cerebral artery will present with acute severe confusion as well. Uh, context, if it's a postpartum patient or a pregnant patient, or there's a seizure that preceded the coma, you want to think about posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or a venous sinus thrombosis uh, or reversible uh, cerebral um, vasoconstriction syndrome, which is granted a rare cause of coma, uh, but something to think about. There, you're going to need advanced imaging and a neurology consultation. Emergency physicians are trained to look for various toxidromes of various uh, uh, overdose situations. Uh, a lot of this is history and context, but some of it is vital signs and physical examination and lab tests. And obviously, if there is a poisoning uh, that is suggested, you're going to want to get a toxic screen and sometimes begin treating empirically. But you need to think about toxic ingestions. The third one is, does the patient need a lumbar puncture with IV antimicrobials? <clears throat> Are there physical findings or history findings, a fever, neck stiffness, a history of bacteremia in the recent past uh, that otherwise suggests a central nervous system infection? That could be meningitis, that could be encephalitis. Uh, I would urge caution in terms of um, brain abscess because although this can cause coma with a normal CT, that would be very rare. And this is one setting where a lumbar puncture can be dangerous in the setting of an abscess partly because uh, you can herniate in that situation. And also uh, lumbar puncture and spinal fluid analysis rarely gives you the etiologic agent, even if it is a brain abscess. You wanna think about a cyclovir <clears throat> if there's a question of uh, herpes simplex encephalitis and, and think about IV doxycycline if it's tick season and you live in a region where there's a lot of tick bites because they're lichiosis uh, and anaplasmosis um, sometimes really bad babesiosis uh, can cause, uh, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever too, obviously. All of these diseases, except for babesiosis, are treatable with doxycycline. Uh, think about sepsis uh, from a non-CNS source as well, and then cover the patient with antibiotics. And I would also recommend whenever you do a lumbar puncture, but especially in this setting, get an opening pressure. It'll directly measure the opening pressure, and uh, it'll give you a real-time uh, 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 number for the pressure. Uh, in addition, does the patient need an emergent EEG? Uh, Non-convulsive status epilepticus accounts for approximately 8% or so of comatose ICU patients. Does the patient have a seizure history? 
whether they have nystagmoid eye movements or myoclonic jerks or lip smacking or other odd, odd movements, um, non-convulsive status epilepticus, you need to get an EEG. And increasingly, uh, portable EEGs uh, that get sent electronically uh, to someone that can read it remotely are becoming more uh, available in the emergency department. Remember too, that if you have a seizure patient and you give them neuromuscular blockers to intubate them and you give them a long acting paralytic, that's gonna cease any visual uh, uh, external seizure motions, uh, but they can continue to have electrical uh, epilepsy. So you need to get an EEG uh, and, uh, and or treat with empiric uh, anti-epileptic drugs if you're uh, concerned about that possibility. And then finally, are there clues either in the history or the physical findings uh, or the past history even of thyroid disease or adrenal disease, uh, pan hypopituitarism uh, would get both of those uh, and endocrine organs, and then Wernicke's encephalopathy. Uh, it's, the thiamine is very uh, uh, safe to give intravenously. And if there's any question, uh, you wanna try to treat while it's early so that the patient doesn't have uh, long-term Korsakoff psychosis. And the treatment would be on a case-by-case -case basis. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you've gotten something out of this. I put my email here. Uh, if anybody has any questions that you would like to email me about, I would be happy to answer them. And thanks again.